Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second event in the Institute for Government's Jamboree of Civil Service uh, Reform. This one is about finding and keeping the right people. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the uh, first event uh, about uh, the extent to which uh, civil service reform is different this time, uh, and uh, we're really looking forward to the rest of the day. Uh, I'm Alex Thomas. I'm a programme director at the Institute for Government, and I'm uh, leading our work on uh, the civil service and uh, policy making. Uh, I'd also like to thank Oracle for supporting us on this day of uh, events. Um, so the core subject of the day, civil service reform, we know the government has uh, high ambitions. We know that they've uh, set out a, a sense of uh, change and a sense of uh, 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 energy on this uh, agenda, despite everything else that they've got on their plate with uh, COVID or perhaps because of everything else on their plate, COVID-19 and um, uh, Brexit and uh, so many other uh, issues, but uh, this is a government that is interested in, in, in how the civil, uh, in how government works, uh, as well as what they want to achieve. But have they really got a plan? Um, uh, uh, how how are they going to develop the detail of? Um, uh, of civil service reform. And one of the things we know about civil service reform is it works uh, uh, when you focus on the detail and you have sustained political uh, interest in it. So that's what today is all about. And for the next hour, we'll be thinking about people. Uh, we'll be thinking about the kind of technical side of it, the, the pay, the pro progression, the turnover. Um, but uh, even more importantly, we'll be thinking about what that means for getting the right skills into uh, the civil service. We've heard about misfits and weirdos. We've heard about cognitive diversity. So how do you actually uh, do that in a way that um, works. Do send in questions. Um, uh, after some brief introductory remarks, um, I'll be uh, looking to all of you for uh, for questions and we'll go to those as, as soon as we can. You can use the function on the uh, uh, Microsoft Teams uh, screen. Um, you can also uh, tweet uh, at uh, hashtag I, uh, IFG uh, Civil Service or IFG Live and um, we will uh, pick them up that way. So through Twitter or through Microsoft Teams, um, do, uh, do get your questions coming in. I'm really pleased that we've got a fantastic uh, panel to uh, uh, to help us explore some of these questions. Um, Catherine Baxendale um, is a human resources specialist uh, and the author of a report uh, about external recruitment into the civil service. Um, Edwina Dunn is an entre entrepreneur who uh, specialises in data. She was a co-founder of uh, Dunn, hum uh, Dunn Humby, which uh, is the company behind um, uh, various consumer loyalty programmes, and she's a uh, commissioner on, on, on the uh, Geospatial Commission. Louisa Nolan uh, is the head of data science projects at the uh, Data Science uh, Lab in the uh, Office of National Statistics. She's worked around statistics research analysis for many years and, and knows the civil service well. Matthew Trimming uh, is a senior advisor at uh, Public and uh, former director of public services uh, for uh, SAP, a software company, and is an expert in innovation. And uh, finally, uh, Max Say is the uh, is an executive director at the National Audit Office, who's worked on digital transformation and uh, workforce issues, among many other things. There, so I'd like to welcome that all, all that panel, uh, all, all the panel, and um, and really uh, pleased to uh, to have you with us. So uh, to kick off, um, Catherine, what does the civil service need to do to get the right people? Thank you, Alex, and thank you to the Institute for Government and Oracle for this uh, timely event. Just for a bit of context and background as we kick off, I just want to just say a little bit about what I did in 2014 and the insights I was very um, fortunate to, to, to learn. So I was commissioned in 2014 by Francis Moore to understand the issues and opportunities in the civil service in regard to senior external hires. So just to kind of caveat my, my points, it is all about the senior, senior civil service. My expertise doesn't really run any further. So just to be aware of that's my segment of knowledge. And as we know, the fast stream graduate entry produces excellent first class civil servants, and I was absolutely fortunate to meet them. But there are critical gaps and experience gaps that uh, outside experts are required. And my work focused uniquely and kind of in an unprecedented way on the way senior hires were handled throughout the recruitment process, how they were inducted into their role and department, how they were set up for success or maybe otherwise in their new role so that they could actually fulfill their potential. I also explored how they're managed, motivated, rewarded and what happens to them after one or two years. I was given unprecedented access, as I said, to all various levels of the senior civil service. Um, and I think I was really struck by how everyone wanted to talk to me, just the very senior people who really didn't need to speak to me, but they did and were very enthusiastic too, as well as those junior people trying to break through into the senior civil service. I conducted one-to-one -one interviews, focus groups, surveys, and people are incredibly honest about 
the strengths of the civil service, but also the shortcomings. And I always try and make that really important point that there's a complete balance between the strengths and the shortcomings. And every time I spoke to people about the shortcomings, there was always an energy to improve. And that's the kind of energy I think we're seeing today. Um, I won't go into any more detail about strengths and opportunities. We're going to probably come into that into the, into the bulk of this uh, panel today. Um, but I did make a number of very practical recommendations. It wasn't magic. It wasn't uh, brain science. This was very practical stuff about improving talent management, talent processes, behaviours, measurement, um, lines of responsibility. The civil service did make an official response when my work was published in 2015 and they basically said that the improvements were accepted there was no argument it was all very very reasonable um, and there were being or will be, would be worked on so the critical question is what's happened since then um, a couple of good things happened in that uh, Rupert McNeil who I spoke to at the Institute of Government part of the panel said that many of those changes I identified he used as a blueprint when he came in so there's lots of great work being done on things like professions and recruitment however in 2018 I did see John Manzoni he wanted to rerun the report just to see what had actually changed because as we know there's a big difference between policy announcements and actually how people feel on the ground and I guess in summary, to close my, my opening remarks, is that five years later, the situation seems incredibly similar. In fact, issues around retention, churn, lack of recognition of expertise in the role, the need for external skills look even more urgent in a kind of post-Brexit COVID world. Um, so I'm incredibly excited to be part of the panel today and thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Catherine. And that really points to that question of, of how it's not enough just to set the direction or to know what you need to do. It's how you actually do it on the ground. Um, turning to uh, Ed, Edwina Dunn now, does, does that chime with your experience of working with civil servants? Well, I'm not sure I'm very expert in in the civil service and, and, and the corridors of power. Um, my experiences are mainly uh, business orientated. Um, you know, I, I learned everything working with industry um, and I, you know, my whole career has been IT, um, the digital transition, transformation and of course data science, which, you know, hadn't really existed outside of medical environments um, to that point. Um, I learned my skills actually working with um, what what was what's now called ONS, um, the Office of, of National Statistics. I mean that I started by processing census data, and actually my my early learning was all about aggregating that um, in a geospatial way. Um, hence my enthusiasm about all things geospatial. I think it's much undervalued, little understood, and tremendously valuable and. You know, perhaps we'll have a chance to talk about all of that. Big fan of, of ONS and what they do. Um, and actually it taught me what we could do when it came to um, transaction data. So say so people's own data. And in fact, Catherine and I both coincided in our Tesco years when we were working on Club Card, which was, you know, a very exciting era. And over that time, um, to share some of the concerns and learning and pains, I probably recruited 3,000 people and it was a very early data and technology business. The two I think are very different and that's little talked about and little understood. IT people on the whole don't really learn about data and data people aren't the best programmers. I mean, those are things that don't often get said. To be an engineer, you need a completely different training to be a data scientist. And actually, a lot of the data scientists we recruited um, who had good logical and analytical skills were actually geographers, surprisingly enough. And so many of them did did very, very well. So about 3000 people and we sent them all over the world and we were the best at the time. And so it was a UK born entrepreneurial development. And, and, and I think we, we did a lot to, to kind of embed some of the ways of working with that. And, and we built it on very young talent. We used to send people to run markets. Um, 
and they were, you know, late 20s, early 30s. And, you know, the big retailers used to say to us, why have you sent me a child? And I said, you know, we, we can send you someone older, but they've not learned as much about data science as these young guys who, who've been doing it for about eight years, which at that time was the maximum. So they were the experts that had learned how to do it. They weren't industry experts, but they were kind of subject matter experts. So anyway, um, that, you know, I learned the power of generalists and specialists, which I think we might talk about. So I'm now um, a commissioner on the Geospatial Commissioner, very proud of our work there in creating a strategy for that, unlocking economic value and skills development, which I think is going to be really important. Um, I'm also on the um, Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation, the CDEI. Um, in my day, you were restricted by what you could do on technology. We're now restricted on what you should do. Um, and so it's a very, very different world and a very interesting navigation. And then my third area, um, because I think it's important, is I'm very much a protagonist for female talent. I have a campaign called The Female Lead. And I'm a big fan of, of encouraging women to be more ambitious, aim higher, do more. And I think, you know, Dunhumby was 50% females. All my businesses have been 50% female. So this whole thing about women don't like technology or aren't very good at maths, rubbish, absolute rubbish. They're very, very good. Finally, just one comment. Um, I think we found um, throughout my career, actually, that people love analysis and strategy. And we used to have this phrase called analysis paralysis, which is the more questions you ask, the more you know, the more you want to know, the more you go round. It's a little bit uh, of what Catherine perhaps was saying, although perhaps more politely than I am. But, you know, this whole idea of let's learn more, let's study more, let's think more. The thing I loved about retailers is they don't think for very long. They go, they execute, they make mistakes and then they get it right. And we used to have this term called dial, D-I-A-L. And it was data that you have to transform into insight, something important. Um, from insight, you create action. So someone actually has to do something and execute something. And then that drives loyalty or engagement. And I think it's as relevant to talent and activating on people as it is to loyalty um, and reward systems. So uh, those are my thoughts at this stage and, and I hope they're relevant and useful. Brilliant. Thank you, Edwina. And I love the challenge that government uh, is uh, if not doing too much thinking but maybe thinking for too long uh, before uh, acting i think that's a really um, a really uh, interesting point and, and how we kind of play in the skills that people have i also didn't realize this was uh, an ons semi reunion so I'm, uh, this is the perfect link to uh, to go over to uh, louisa nolan uh, louisa thank you for uh, being with us do, do you think one, one sort of jumping off point do you think that the the civil service and government makes enough use of the expertise they already have um, I think that's an interesting question, but first of all, I want to say thank you to Edwina for such a, uh, for the love of her and that's, um, that's a great way to start. <laughs> um, I think uh, I wanted really to talk about um, my experience in the data science campus at ONS. Um, we were set up three years ago really as an experiment to build capability in data science, which as Edwina says, um, three years ago, an emerging discipline and a new profession for government. So certainly whether or not we make the most use of the skills we have, certainly there were some skills that we didn't have at the time. Um, and to use that to drive innovation, take advantage of opportunities like tools, techniques and data in the digital age to help make better decisions. Um, and then to embed our learning from the campus and teams across government. So it's not just the campus doing it, but we're spreading this across government. We knew we need to do things differently to recruit the right people. Um, we wanted to start with people who had excellent technical skills when they came in and then think about how we use those to build people, to build the career pathways and bring in um, early career people. And there weren't many data scientists in civil service, so we need to recruit from the private sector and academia as well. 
which is difficult because you need to find a way to be attractive when you can't necessarily pay as much as the private sector. And then we need to keep them. So for the recruitment, we thought about the reasons that um, people come. We asked people why they'd apply as well. And really, it's a number of different things. So you making the language right. Civil service is quite good at um, talking to yourself. I've seen some dreadful job adverts which are completely unintelligible to anybody outside that area. So it's writing things in a way that people who aren't in the civil service, who might be in academia or in the private sector can understand. And then emphasising the things that you get from working in the civil service and for us particularly in the campus. So things like the public good. We don't talk about this much because we're slightly embarrassed to, but most of the people I work with fundamentally want to be doing something that's useful for the UK population. I think the other things that we emphasise are in the campus, we're doing interesting and exciting things. We want to be cutting edge, so there might be more variety than some jobs in the private sector. But at the same time, you're not having to apply for your job every two years, which might be an advantage over academia. And I'm not I'm not um, embarrassed to, to try and use those particular <laughs> pulls to bring people in. And I think we've done well. Um, we had a campaign for three posts towards the end of last year and we had over 100 applicants. We've grown from six people three and a bit years ago to over 70. And some of those are geospatial, which is brilliant because everybody loves a map. And we're about equally split between people who come from the private sector, from academia and then from the civil service. I think then to keep people, you've got to retain people's interest. The learning is really important and having a professional career path is really important. And that's some of what we've been involved in building, not just for early career to, to build people up, but also for people later on in their careers. Keeping cutting edge. So <laughs> don't want to say we're overthinking it, but making sure we're always pushing the boundaries. And then again, thinking about that public good, the value that people get from doing their job with the actionable insights. Um, and then thinking about skills as well, we bring people in with data science skills, but there are other things you need as well, which we, we have touched on. So we need people who can do project management. We use Agile, which is a brilliant way to get data science projects done. We need to think about, there's no unicorn, so do we need to bring in software engineers? Um, and obviously communication is really important. You could be the best data scientist in the world, but if you can't explain it, it's not much use. So thinking about that, keeping that flexibility in teams, keeping the creativity to, to keep to drive the innovation, to drive the interest so that people don't get bored and want to go off and move to something else, which we've been quite good at. But obviously challenges remain. When we started out, there weren't many people offering data scientist jobs in the civil service. There's a lot more now, which is a mark of our success, I think, and of the, um, the need for data scientists. I think we've never been more in, in demand than, than over the last few months, certainly. And I think there's another big uh, area as well where we can train technical people to talk about their data, but data is not just the numbers, it's the narrative, it's the caveats. How do we make sure that the people we're talking to are sufficiently understanding of that, that they're not just stripping out the caveats and just talking about the numbers? It's a two way, two way street. But it's exciting times. What can we scale up? What can we learn from what we've done in the campus? That's great. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, exciting times indeed. And we'll come back to some of those uh, some of those themes, particularly around the kind of re recruitment of, uh, of, of people. I think it's really interesting. M Matthew, Matthew uh, Trimming. Uh, uh, we've uh, we've touched a couple of times, and I said at the, the start, the um, uh, the government has a sort of ambitious direction for reform, um, uh, uh, and we're starting to see the emergence of the the plans. Um, but but uh, how do you think uh, the government is likely, and the civil service is likely, to translate uh, that direction into plans, and particularly thinking about innovation, which I know is your uh, area of expertise? Yeah, I think we over the last couple of months have had the privilege uh, at public of uh, supporting uh, Alex Chisholm and um, Michael Gove on the modernisation and reform work and had the opportunity to uh, talk to the IFG about it as well. Um, it's been a fascinating exercise for us at public because we are not natural consultants. What we do is find innovative technology businesses which we invest in or sometimes we buy them outright and then we uh, try and encourage one or other bits of government to take modern technology more seriously than they are in the uh, aid of delivering better public policy. Uh, I'm sure the previous event had plenty of commentary around, you know, why is it different this time? Um, 
I would say, why have they got a good chance this time? One is there is senior political will behind it, not just uh, Michael Gove, you know, sort of playing the, the Francis Mould role, if you like, back in 20, 20, uh, 2011 to, to 2015, but uh, a desire to really think about, you know, the structure of the centre, how does number 10 relate to the Treasury, relate to the Cabinet Office, and I think asking some of those kind of structural questions is very helpful uh, because it starts to set the context in which, you know, you are going to be more able to attract the type of, uh, you know, the diversity of skills, I suppose, uh, that you're going to need to be successful to deliver on the modernisation and reform. One small triumph that we had over the last um, couple of months was to convince people that they should not call it a transformation because transformation generally sort of you know it repels as many people as it attracts in my uh, uh, humble uh, and limited experience so modernization and reform is the uh, is is the focus and and having having a real um energy in not just wanting to do it but the manner in which you are doing it um i was very struck by although i'm not a civil servant so i was not at civil service live last week but i was very struck by the language that alex chisholm and other colleagues were using to uh, get people involved it didn't feel sort of top down it didn't feel like you know we are going to do this to you it was very consultative, it was very thoughtful, and it's already kicked off using some quite uh, modern, innovative consultation technology, a set of uh, engagement activities that will run over the summer and kind of inform the debate, which I think for those within the civil service hopefully makes it feel a bit fresher and more innovative than perhaps things that have happened in the past. One other point I'd make in wrapping up is, and it really picks up the point uh, of um, Edwina's point really about um, uh, paralysis by analysis. We have, uh, with one or two exceptions, and just to be a little bit provocative, largely a sort of analog senior civil service. That does not mean it does not have iPhones or even laptops and maybe it can even have one or two people writing bits of code in the background but its thought processes are analog and where they come from you know Oxbridge is a great set of institutions PPE is a great um, training to a certain extent but if you have an analog senior civil service with a lack of pluralism in the skills that you have in it you are not going to manifest uh, the change that everyone at this point in the process wants to see. And so how do you uh, get more, this is a word I hate actually, but it just became a bit of a light motif over the last couple of months. People kept banging on about, you know, we've got to get more porosity into the civil service. And, you know, once I'd actually looked up porosity and realised that they just meant, you know, more people who are a bit more different, coming in at different levels and working in a bit more of a, a teamy way, uh, I understood what they were talking about. But I think, you know, if you can not just attract people, but identify who you've already got to work in a multidisciplinary way on policy challenges that are almost always cross-cutting, then you will give yourself a decent chance to make progress in a way that perhaps has not been um, achieved in the past. Thanks, Matthew. That's uh, great. And I'm very pleased we've got another P word to add to every every word in this uh, debate seems to begin with P, whether it's pay, performance, promotion, permeability. And now we've got porosity as well. So uh, uh, there we go with a nod to Gus O'Donnell's old uh, uh, P's. Max, you're, you're uh, in an excellent position to um, 
uh, respond to some of that um, uh, challenge, particularly around um, uh, uh, around getting uh, new civil servants in and whether the uh, senior civil service is uh, uh, thinking into uh, analog a way. I'm also uh, interested in your thoughts on uh, on how how will government know how how will the civil service know uh, if it's getting this right or not, Max. Great, Th thanks, Alex. Uh, really, really great discussion, and, and thank you so much for uh, organising this. Um, so, just a, a bit of background for people: the the NEO publishes uh, reports on on various aspects of government. We've done a lot of work on skills and capability in government. Uh, just last Friday, we published an update on the development and progress of specialist skills in government. So that's available on our website for people who are interested. The, the focus of our work recently has been very much on government functions and how they've developed. Um, and uh, in, in many ways, it's a story of uh, good progress, but still lots more to do, very familiar in this kind of uh, environment. But I think there are three senses in which, uh, like Matthew, I'm, I'm kind of optimistic about this and see that there's a real opportunity to embed some, some really good changes. Um, and there are the three areas where functions really make a difference to how we think about skills and expertise within government. The, the first is on accountability and uh, resolving some of the ambiguities that exist in government. Naturally, civil service is dealing with some pretty high powered and difficult problems, and that creates a lot of difficulties about what exactly the best uh, way forward is, not, not least that sort of perennial question about political and administrative choices. And what the government functions do is um, start to establish what are some of the key roles for uh, expert groupings within government. So what is a finance responsibility? What is a, an HR responsibility? What is a um, what are the government standards for doing things in technology or commercial transactions? So that that helps to just clarify those roles. The second and, and linking to that is a, a kind of clearer complementarity and separation between uh, what are policy and reactive uh, activities and what are these longer term capability building activities and I think it's pretty hard you know I feel for senior civil servants having to deal with stuff you know as we've seen this year and last just lots and lots of really big very very urgent very difficult issues while at the same time thinking about the longer term development of the civil service building that capability doing some of the long term things around whatever it is pensions climate change that we need to think about um, and I and one of the, the the main areas of our reports in the last few years has been really thinking about what the role of functions is in informing government planning. So planning and spending, the link between cabinet office and treasury that Matthew mentioned, all of these areas are incredibly difficult and complex, but functions have a role to play there in informing it. You know, if it's program delivery, thinking about how plausible and realistic some of the timescales are on major programs, for example. The third area where functions play a key role is in, in creating pathways and development opportunities for people with expertise from outside and internally. Uh, so hopefully building up the, the opportunities for porosity um, and, and those external hires that Catherine mentioned, as well as building a sort of mixed pathway of internal and external development as Louise has talked about. So these, these uh, functions are able to create and support the professional development of people. But I think by having a clearer role in government, it also helps to dock people into that process. So rather than coming in as a specialist, but having a sort of very generalist expectation, the functions are able to tailor that to an extent and, and build those pathways in a more clear way. So those three things, I think, deal with some of the challenges, not all of them, with, with bringing people in and building up skills. It, it tackles that sort of ambiguity that people face, the, the tendency for people to be pulled into the urgent and, and for that to become the sort of uh, high profile thing. And also to have a kind of more consistent and clearer uh, pathway and and uh, development group. Some of the challenges around that that we picked up in our report last last week were it does create some questions around you know uh, the the balance and diversity of the people that are brought in. It's pretty pretty noticeable, and I know the data is not not fantastic, but there are uh, quite diff quite big differences in gender um, uh, gender balance across the different functions. For example, um, it does raise you know further challenges for us to deal with those in, a, in an effective way. But I think you know, one of our key recommendations is we need to understand what expertise and skills people have, how that's working, what those pathways are, what are the barriers, um, and only by understanding that are we able to, to then deal with them. 
Thank you, Max. And uh, my my first question was going to be picking up on that sort of what 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 are those barriers? What are the barriers to to to, to recruiting? But um, others have uh, are, you know, made similar points uh, more eloquently than me. So we'll go straight to questions from uh, the that people have sent in. And there are, there are three that kind of play in this this sort of territory about uh, about how to uh, make the most of um, external hires, but also uh, how to uh, make the most of the the uh, people who are already in the civil service. So Jonathan Potts has said. I feel the civil service has not been too bad at getting good people in, but how do we get better at understanding, valuing and using the difference in approach and insight that external hires typically bring rather than ignoring or trying to homogenize it? So how do we make, make best use of those uh, external hires, whatever their skills are? Uh, Olivia uh, makes a point about um, uh, about the mechanisms for getting them in, says the success profiles application framework. Success profiles is the sort of newish uh, version of, uh, uh, of of recruitment and uh, performance management that civil services bring in. Um, uh, but that that application framework is weighted very heavily towards long standing civil servants and those who understand how to use the correct language, something I recognise, as opposed to applicants who actually have the skills required. So how do we make applications more inclusive and flexible to account for this and ensure we're valuing diverse backgrounds and skills? And then and then Mary Jacob uh, has said dedicated civil servants at uh, grade seven, so team leader level and, and under can feel sidelined by external appointments instead of investing in their own professional development. Uh, and we have very talented civil servants and we don't appear to capture those skills and um, build on them. Um, so a few different perspectives there about bringing in uh, external people. So. Uh, let's just spend a few minutes thinking about kind of the 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 pros and cons, the ways it works and the ways it doesn't work. And uh, Catherine, you're an ideal person to uh, to kick off with this. You might have predicted I was coming to you. That's fine, Alex, and thank you very much. I'm going to pick up on the um, let's let's do it in logical order. So mechanism for bringing people in. Um, it's what I found is that it's incredibly patchy and inconsistent. So as soon as you mention a terrible example, you're also going to look at a fantastic example. But um, so I think what I found is that as a potential external hire at an incredibly senior and valuable level, you could um, by just by circumstance be treated in a very unqualified, non-quality way and in another area, high quality way. So my very simple thing was we've got to have some very basic quality standards and what came up and it's so basic but at the same time so sometimes difficult to achieve is that there wasn't always one person who was responsible for a particular role to be filled or for a particular candidate care which in the private sector or in a recruitment uh, agency that would be completely the norm that you'd have some form of candidate care and in fact I had incredibly senior people talking to me as if they were the, I had a great quote which was I was treated if I was basically the least worst option they could find you know, it had quite a human impact that this inconsistencies. But as I, soon as I say that negative, I also want to say there was good examples too. And a lot, a lot of things have been worked on. But if you think about bringing great people in and then the experience of being recruited is so suboptimum, it's very difficult to one, bring them in and two, that they, when they arrive, they're in a really positive and motivated way. And I found lots of examples when that wasn't the case. So if I can, if that's my little bit on recruitment, which obviously I hope that it's uh, changed, but I get a sense that it might have changed in some places, but not others. If I can then just um, talk about making use of the skills that people bring in. What I found, again, in some places, so some places good, but some places bad, that people found that when they were brought in, say, to be a big change agent across a multi-department uh, change project they actually were not in any way set up for success in fact if I'm really honest some of them felt they were actually being set up for failure so they don't know the civil service they just know how to run big projects and they didn't necessarily have a manager supported them I didn't even sometimes get a sense that managers always necessarily felt responsible for them so if they had a bad experience and they left I'm not sure there were any consequences or repercussions which you can imagine is pretty powerful um, I got a sense that their inductions were incredibly often inadequate, um, inconsistent. They just didn't know how things were worked. And you're dealing also with incredibly powerful, successful people who actually at some point are going to say, I don't need to take this. I can go somewhere else. and I'm incredibly valuable. Now, again, this might have changed over five years, but I had some incredibly heartfelt people that felt I wanted to give my skills and experience to the country. I was literally telling me that I've taken an enormous pay cut. I'm working every hour God sends 
And I'm not sure that anyone cares. And I'm not sure that I'm actually going to achieve anything. So that's just a little bit of verbatim and just some numbers against it. And then I'll, I'll finish and move on is I did see and it's very difficult to see some of the numbers. And I do hope the data collections got better. But when I tried to look very dispassionately objectively at the numbers, it was clear there was higher turnover, turnover among external hires and their internal equipments. I found that external hires at the senior civil service level made up 25 percent of that population, but 50 percent of the resignations when I was there. Now, obviously, there could have been circumstances. And again, I can hear people say, well, it's very unusual then, Catherine, etc. But, you know, that was the fact there. And then you can also hear people saying, oh, yeah, but they weren't very good or they couldn't really fit in. But I also looked at those that, 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 that bit of data as much as I could. And it was actually the higher performance that had the higher resignation rates. So there, is, there isn't that kind of, oh, well, they were meant to go anyway. And, and then for anyone a bit more data is when you then look to the engagement scores for external hires versus internal promoted counterparts, their engagement scores were significantly lower on a number of different levels. So you just got a sense that you want to attract really important and skilled people at very critical roles. And it's not because anyone wants to do a bad job. It's almost systemic that they end up feeling quite neglected or they felt that the only option was them to leave. Now, obviously, there's going to be pockets of success, but I did find some pockets of failure where I felt some really simple, practical improvements could be made to make the most of the people because everyone I met wanted to do a good job. And it just for various circumstances or environment structure that things weren't um, as we would want it to be. Thanks, Catherine. One of the really interesting things that comes out of what you were saying is this interaction between the the technical and the processes that, that have grown up over years and the cultural and how one feeds the other. And um, some of this is very simple, but equally, as you say, some of it is very deep. And it's a it's a uh, it's it's this thinking about what the sort of practical specific ch changes are that can then reinforce a positive a positive culture. I, L Louisa, you, you, you described earlier a, a sort of positive recruitment example of bringing lots of new <laughs> people in and creating a, 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 a new thing, a new thing. How did uh, how did that work and how did you find uh, the sort of ease of integrating different specialisms and uh, uh, people from di different backgrounds? Um, it's all been really interesting. I recognise that question around success profiles, which I think are a bit easier than the, the previous competency, purely competency based. But there is a danger that only people within the civil service understand that. So we work quite hard at writing things in English that people might understand if they haven't spent six years in the civil service already and that seems to have helped. I think the other part of this is that um, when you recruit people and when you manage them when they come in you need to have somebody who understands those skills to be able to manage them which may be some of the challenges with bringing people in at the senior level from outside. Um, so everybody thinks they want a data scientist but nobody really knows what data science is. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pretend there's a a, a good definition of it. Um, but you also, when, you, when you're interviewing or reading applications, if you don't know the language someone else uses, which can be different in my backgrounds in astrophysics, that's different from statistics, which is different from economics. If you don't know that language, you can miss some really important things and not understand and reject people not understanding it. So there's there's something around language, both in the in the communication and in the understanding of what people people are telling you. And I think we need to remember uh, there's something also about training people to do recruitment as well. We need to remember that the goal of recruitment is to get the best person for the job. Um, which yeah, means sometimes on your application, have they done enough to make you think that they're interesting to interview? Thanks, uh, Louisa. Um, there's a question here that's got um, got a lot of uh, engagement. It's, uh, it's 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 sort of quite a technical one, folks, about the civil servant and, and pay bands. So uh, it's from Scott. Pay bands from for similar roles often vary between government departments, which means civil servants hop between departments to get pay rises. Departments need the freedom to offer packages that attract staff to their department. But how should this be balanced to retain good staff? I think there's a there's a, 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 a um, you know something I recognise there, and there's. Uh, uh, that's an important question and there's a broader question there as well about the uh, I think someone else has asked it about the freedom that individual departments and parts of departments should have to set their own uh, structures and uh, and and pay bands and, and incentive uh, systems there there's a patchwork uh, and it's different for the senior civil service and uh, and, and, and other civil servants but um, uh, Max do you have thoughts about that? 
Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Alex. Um, so in our report that we published just last week, we, we put some information there about some of the uh, the disparities for similar jobs across different uh, parts of government and the very, very wide ranges that you, you can see. I mean, enormous differences between um, people that ostensibly look like they're doing similar things. And there is a concern that we picked up across government about what's, what's called the kind of internal market. Um, so people often fishing in the same pool of people for, because they maybe understand the language and, and the role better than, than others and, and people moving around government, which is both not good at bringing people in um, from outside of government, but also creates the, the kind of churn problems that people sometimes worry about. Um, although you do, I guess, get some cross fertilization even within government, which isn't necessarily a bad thing either. So I'm not saying it's entirely bad, but it, it does. It is a bit uh, unproductive. Um, also, from a value for money perspective, and we always care about that in a sense, bidding everybody, bidding up uh, the the salaries of, of a small group of people who are already in government isn't necessarily the most effective use of, of how, we're, how we're doing that. So um, we are uh, we recommend in our report several things uh, for functions to do to try and address those disparities. Um, a lot of it comes down to understanding what they are, setting slightly clearer blueprints about what the roles are, because it may be that the reason there's a disparity is because two people who are named the same thing are doing very, very different roles with very different requirements, in which case we should be more clear about that and surface that. Um, so there, that is absolutely one of the things to do. But returning to sort of my, my general theme about functions, that is the that is one way in which that can be addressed. If you have clearer structures, clearer expectations, people who know what they're asking for when they form job descriptions is a really powerful thing. And therefore, um, having functions shape some of those job specs is 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 valuable because it it, it gets the right language to to appeal to the people who are looking at the at the job opportunities. Um, just just one minor thing I picked up in the in the list of questions somebody asked about why aren't uh, recruitment opportunities done in, in batches? So uh, why, why is every single department going out for every single thing separately? Um, that, that's actually something that has been tried recently. Um, I, I'm aware that the government finance function at least has has tried to hire certain roles as a as a, a kind of collective thing and then and then only after that to try and best match people to the the areas of government that they that they work with. I don't know how much has has how much that has uh, continued, but I've certainly seen it happen in the past and it, it feels like those kinds of activities might be a way to help bring a little bit more consistency, um, a bit of better understanding of what the cohort is. And I think in terms of onboarding people, if you take people on board in a group, it's easier to then design something that helps them understand where they're, where they're coming into. Thanks, Max. And um, uh, that's also uh, in the last few years, the sort of recruitment campaigns around getting people to work on um, uh, Brexit in whatever form, uh, more recently on the COVID response. We've seen uh, the government kind of uh, the civil service naturally leading towards these mass um, uh, mass recruitment um, campaigns uh, to, to, to deal with the, 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 the pressure on it. The, the other thing that um, that uh, recruiting in that way does is uh, allow you to really focus on, on diversity. And we've had quite a few questions about diversity and inclusion and uh, I think we can think of that in terms of diversity of protected characteristics, um, uh, socioeconomic diversity uh, as well. Um, uh, somebody who's uh, anonymous said what more can be done to ensure there's social diversity amongst those uh, in senior roles um, but also the uh, the Dominic Cummings diversity of uh, thought and cognitive diversity and diversity of, of experience. So there's uh, there's there's lots that the civil service still needs to, to, to do on that. I think um, Progress has been made on, uh, on on gender in particular, but there's still quite a long way to go on everything else. Edwina, you talked passionately about uh, about this uh, earlier. Um, what, what, what would you suggest to the government and the civil service to do to to, to get more diversity of uh, thought, background, and um, uh, and experience? I mean, I grew up in in the retail industry, which, believe me, is uh, about as male uh, as you can get, and. Um, it, it was surprising, it, you know, it's very, very hard um, to be the only woman in, in a boardroom over and over again. And I think um, you, you don't see it if you're a man. You only see it when you're aware as a woman that you're constantly walking into a room full of men. And I think it, it's not intended. 
it, it's not anything that anybody is trying to do. But I think, you know, there's a very simple phrase, you can't be what you can't see. And if we can't see women succeeding, um, doing the role that we're passionate about, um, having a life and some kind of balance around that, if we can't see that and lots of examples of it, um, it, it does deter. Uh, and I think, um, you know, there is an, an awful lot of work that, that needs to be done on this. I mean, you know, my campaign is simply to tell women's stories and to showcase lots and lots of women who aren't, you know, Taylor Swift or Beyonce, um, which unfortunately is what girls look at um, on social media for six hours every day and then get miserable because they're not Beyonce and they're not Taylor Swift. You know, what we have to show all the time is that there are very, very successful, fulfilled, happy women out there doing great jobs. And I think it's it's about telling those stories. And, you know, people are very smart. You know, you can say anything you want, but if they can't see it happening in real life, then they know. Uh, and I think it is that simple. It it has to be real. And, and I think it is the way, you know, it's the way we encourage all kinds of diversity, actually. And, and just to, to one other point, which I was really interested with, was the debate on, you know, recruitment, et cetera, is that, you know, I was taught from a very young age that recruitment's the most important job you do. And if there's someone you want, you, you, you go get them, even if it takes you three years. And, and I think having a few great people who are diverse, and who you are committed to, you are committed to embedding them in your organisation, committed to helping make them successful, um, is really important. And, you know, to then create an environment where they can share and teach and, and kind of visualise what the future looks like from, from their eyes you know, to make that sort of visual. It's why I love maps so much, because you can see things, whereas a lot of technology and data isn't visual. But if we can create this image of what success looks like, you know, potentially with divert, you know, generalists as well as specialists, all being rewarded really highly, it makes a fantastic difference. We know it when we see it. Mm. That's great. Loads of great points there. Three things really struck me. One, role models and uh, uh, and the importance of recruitment and really focusing on, on on people and getting the right people. The second, you said about storytelling. And then the third about, um, uh, you didn't use this phrase, but uh, walking the talk and uh, kind of credibility there. Uh, Catherine, you wanted to to come in and then, and then we'll move on. And Matthew, I'll come to you in a minute. Catherine. Thank you, Alex. And just to say, obviously, I support everything that the Weedon said as someone who shared that retail environment with her a number of decades ago. Um, I completely support everything she says. Um, in terms of my particular insight into the civil service, um, I wasn't looking at gender or any other uh, elements. The key thing that I did look at as diversity, which I think is relevant here, is diversity of experience and diversity of thought. And what I got back, uh, what I heard when people have been incredibly at candid, it was obviously all anonymized, and then I just gathered all the comments together. If we take diversity of experience of such a strong feeling, it wasn't just one or two sort of very disgruntled people. It was very widespread that they felt that their previous experience was not counted. In fact, there was almost elements of you didn't really start the clock in the civil service until day one you arrived. The fact that you've done these most amazing uh, projects and achievements beforehand were kind of inconsequential. So people found that quite difficult to cope with. So number one, if we want to have diversity of experience, very simply, we need to value it and understand it. I had a, such a simple little recommendation and I share it because it just seems so obvious, but it wasn't happening. That when someone new was going to start in a department, it might be nice for the department all to get together and give that person on their first day a little bit of an outing of, oh, what have you done? Who are you? Could you tell us a bit about you? And then get them back, say, four or six weeks later before they've got to immerse to say, oh, what did you find out about how well we're doing or not doing? And what improvements could you identify? Just really simple stuff 
But that wasn't happening. So um, I just want to put that in. If we do win on the diversity of experience and bring people in, we do need to recognise and respect it. Mm. And then the, the next point, very briefly on diversity of thought, is that you've got to be open to challenge. You've got to accept dissenting views. Um, I, I came across quite a lot of examples where people were saying that they felt the culture was resistant to change and had a closed mentality, that they were process rather than outcome driven. And uh, one of the quotes, I'm just looking at my quote for cheap, was the culture values strategy over operational details um, and the culture does not encourage dissenting views. Now, obviously, no one wants that. Obviously, you need to find the right way of doing it. But when you've got lots of people talking about diversity of thought and diversity of experience, you've got to have the right fertile environment for these great people to prosper in, um, which probably just means quite practical, sensible steps but they need to be taken in order to get the best from those people to have the maximum positive impact for the country. Thanks, Catherine. It's that practical cultural side again. I mean, just pick up on your first point. It's a, uh, I think we've covered the question, which was about ex external experience being valued, but somebody who's anonymous says, I joined the civil service as an ex-lawyer. Over a four year period, I was told by four senior civil servants that my legal experience would not be considered when applying for any senior civil servant uh, roles. So there's something, you know, it's, it's, um, it's quite dependent on individuals and, 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 and specific pockets of the civil service rather than, um, uh, rather than uh, uh, more sort of systematically addressed. Um, there's a, a question, uh, and Matthew, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you on this. It's about, it's about dealing with poor performance from the IFG's uh, own Jill Rutter. Um, how can we deal with the perennial and under-addressed issue of poor performers? Uh, massive drag on the middle tier, very demotivating, but HR are traditionally very uh, cautious. Uh, Matthew, I mean, don't feel you need to comment on the detail of uh, managing poor performance in the civil service, but is this something that's on the government's uh, agenda, the civil services reform agenda? It absolutely is. Um but you're going to need a bit of a culture shift for people to start taking it seriously, I think. I mean, many people on this panel will have run businesses, are running businesses outside the public sector. Uh, we all know that, you know, you can hire in haste and repent at leisure, as Edwina was saying uh, earlier. Um, and the most successful teams I've ever run have been where I've been very, very slow, not mentally, but sort of, you know, cautious about us bringing a whole bunch of new people in because sometimes that creates too much, uh, not too much diversity, but just too much noise. And then inevitably you find that, uh, you know, you brought in four people and you've got to let two of them go in the first 12 months. And that's just, a, you know, a lot of distraction basically. I think people want to take this more seriously. I think to do that they're going to have to really consider um, three things. It's always three things isn't it but here we go. Um, one is there are just too many managers in the civil service. I'm not wishing to get technical about you know delegated responsibilities and layers of management and all those sorts of things that people worry about in large organisations. But, you know, when you've got a span of control where you've got a manager just looking after two or three people, you do have to ask yourself, is, is, is that correct as a sort of basic thing when compared to almost any other industry on, on the planet? So if you're going to ask people to manage, then you've got to give them sufficient, you know, uh, breadth of capability to to manage. Um, that's the first point. The second point is, um, you know, there is no consequence management in the civil service uh, outside of, you know, one or two very high profile examples that I can think of. Uh, you know, uh, I think an ex um, chief executive of the child support agency sort of fell on his sword about 15 years ago in front of a select committee and you know the whole world thought, oh my goodness you know the civil service will now grind to a halt because someone has actually fessed up and said yeah it happened on my watch and I'm going to take the hit and you know fair enough and total respect to that in individual but you know actions have consequences many of them should be good and rewarded and uh, you know highlighted as the right behaviours. But when people, you know, for whatever reason, they haven't got it right, and it's never ever malicious, or very, very rarely, 
then unfortunately there has to be some consequences to it. And it can't just be, oh, well, sorry, dear chap, we'll just shuffle you off to another job in another department and hope that no, nobody notices. So I think to wrap up, pe people are gripped of this. Um, it is a very difficult thing to do. Um, Michael Gove spoke rather eloquently, I thought, about it in his Ditchley speech a few weeks ago of this culture of kind of involving everybody in a problem. And therefore, these weren't precisely his words, but I think the, the, the idea he was sort of reaching for was if you involve everybody, sometimes you resolve nothing uh, because you sort of desiccate responsibility so thinly across teams and departments and agencies that when something does go wrong, everyone can just sort of point at somebody else and go, oh, well, you know, but I did my 5%. We need to get to a situation where you have more sort of you know, collective responsibility that actually has consequences for those who do well, but also for those who uh, do badly. A very difficult thing to do in the current culture, but uh, absolutely necessary to make the changes that everybody wants to see. Thanks, Matthew. This feels like the ideal time to bring in the National Audit Office. So, um, uh, Max, there's, if you want to pick up on any of those sort of performance and accountability and responsibility, uh, points there but also there's a specific question that, that goes a bit to what you were saying earlier about value for money in terms of paying people you know should we bring anonymous uh, asks should we bring back pay progression um, uh, it's abolition a few years back is a major disincentive for civil servants to stay at a specific grade and fuels excessive churn if not uh, and I think there are good arguments why not but what other things should we consider to encourage civil servants to remain in uh, roles for longer so sort of the performance and pay and, and how those uh, in, in, intersect uh, Max. So, so I'll pick up on the, the accountability point first which is you know absolutely ag agree that the challenge uh, I, I talked about a bit before was the sort of ambiguity that exists in government sometimes and often what you find the skill in being a senior civil servant is is in navigating ambiguity rather than doing the thing that needs doing um, and and I think that that is that is a real challenge um, the uh, the the issue with with poor performance I think you know I can see it both from the people managing poor performances that because of that ambiguity, it's quite hard to then say you didn't do something because the clarity of the expectation isn't always there, but also from the individual being managed, you know, they maybe just be in the wrong position. It's hard then to satisfy those requirements to, to know exactly what you're trying to do. And I think people sometimes find themselves in very difficult positions as a result. So I'm, um, I totally agree that that, that there is a broad question there about how we, how we resolve that. I think, I think, you know, having having clearer professional and functional or w whatever other structures there are to help do that, I think is is one way to do it. You know, you can say to somebody who is on a commercial team, for example, if you haven't got the necessary commercial training or the necessary commercial skills and you haven't managed these things in a certain way, it's a bit easier to then have that conversation. I think the other thing that has been a positive development in government is recognizing some of those accountability challenges in things like senior uh, responsible owners for major projects having somebody who is cl clearly responsible and sets out their responsibilities and if they don't feel that they have the necessary levers can set them out in a letter and setting that it's not going to be perfect but it's it is a step in the right direction because it forces people to confront the very issue you talked about um pay progression uh sidestep that a little bit uh, alex <laughs> but um you know you and I know it only applies to a sort of smaller percentage of maybe 20 percent of the civil service workforce but if you are working in a specialist area you could see pay progression coming as you built up your expertise even if your role in any given time was the same so you might say be working on uh, com contract management in a given department but because you're building your expertise and experience in broader ways you're starting to c get qualifications and support cross-government initiatives what, whatever it is that you're doing that can help you satisfy that that sort of dual requirement of self-development but also continuity in the role and, and the, the sort of value that you have to that to that particular service 
yeah no, i completely agree with that and recognize recognize that i think um uh, pay progression is uh, in my view less important than uh, career progression and uh, and the career progression shouldn't necessarily require moving around to completely different fields and that's the kind of uh, elixir we've we've had a question uh, and we're just two minutes from the end now so um just a couple of really short contributions on on, on this one and then i'll wrap up but it came up uh, earlier as well um uh, i came from a big four consultancy into a policy role i can see the need to pay large fees for areas with the skills gap like technology it would be interesting to hear the panel's view on the use of consultants for credibility instead of trusting in policy experts. Uh, Edwina, then Matthew, then Louisa, very briefly, and then I'm going to wrap up. Uh, Edwina, what do you think about use of consultants? Oh, crikey, that's a big one, isn't it? Um, look, my experience is you've got tremendous talent within your ranks, and I think quite often um, you don't always leverage what you have, and and I and I would look. I mean, I think by aligning more, by having more groups with cross-party skills and speaking out for those, where what consultants do is contribute rather than lead, would give you an awful lot more than you have. It, it's a bit like. You know, it's a bit like when you have respect for data, um, you know, you have to compete with opinion. So data is evidence and opinion is opinion. But but, you know, opinions made up of years and years of experience and you kind of want to put it all together. So my view is uh, I wouldn't let consultants lead. I would use your own people to lead and for them to contribute. Thanks, Edwina. Matthew, the consultant. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, you guys at the IFG have written very eloquently and very recently about how best to use consultants. So um, I would encourage everyone to uh, read that uh, and I'm not going to sort of rehash it now. I think um, consultants, particularly when serving government, um, it, it kind of slightly feeds on a unhealthy desire to end, endlessly analyse, as I think, uh, again, Edwina said earlier, because the comfort zone of many who are asked to lead such work within the civil service is to, uh, you know, oh yes, I'm sure we could solve this problem if only we had done a bit more analysis. And you think, well, come on guys, we've done kind of six weeks. I guess we could do seven weeks, maybe we could do seven months, but, you know, Will you be 5%, 50% further towards the answer by then? My contention would be no. Uh, again, in all the teams I've, yeah, I've yeah. run, I've never done, um, you know, let's have an hour's meeting because there's far too, too, far too much ritual around that. You know, get them to stand up, get them to talk for 15 minutes and you will be 80% of the way towards the decisions that you need to make on almost anything. Uh, actually. So use them sparingly, use them strategically. If you do, if you're saying we need them for operational execution, then ask yourself some pretty basic questions, which is, you know, why haven't we built this capability internally? And why isn't it important to us enough to do that? And why do we have to pay three times over the odds for, you know, someone in their 20s, nothing wrong with that, I have a daughter in her 20s, um, to sort of basically learn on <laughs> your time. Thanks, thanks Matthew and uh, we've gone over time but I did say I'll come back to Louisa so uh, any final reflections, last word to you just for 15 seconds Louisa. I think we go to consultants for two reasons, sometimes we think it's useful to have somebody independent to come in and have a look who's not brought into the culture and that probably can be helpful sometimes and sometimes we think we lack the skills but maybe we should look look more closely at our own teams to do it. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, everyone on the panel for being uh, uh, absolutely fantastic, full of uh, insights. We uh, couldn't have hoped to have covered the whole uh, of the, the ground there. Thanks um, also to uh, Oracle for um, supporting this whole day uh, and uh, do join us at one o'clock for the next event, uh, How to Measure Success with uh, a brilliant panel on that as well. Thank you all. <laughs>